Okay, good afternoon. Welcome everybody to this month's Western Region Colloquium. Today it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Elizabeth Hadley. Dr. Hadley is a professor of biology at Stanford University. She received her PhD from Berkeley in 1995 and previously worked for the National Park Service as a paleoecologist for Yellowstone National Park. Her current research probes how perturbations such as climatic change influence the evolution ecology of neogene vertebrates and involves a combined field and laboratory approach. Professor Hadley's field research involves excavation of finely stratified quaternary paleontological sites and a collection of modern specimens in North America, South America, and India. She works on the evolution and ecology of the Yellowstone ecosystem and has established the suite of animals present there prior to exploration by Lewis and Clark. Documentation of the native mammals, including wolves and elk, was critically valuable for park management policies and wolf reintroduction. Recent work includes a Yellowstone study of how climatic change over the past two decades has severely impacted amphibians and a California project examining the impact of the late Pleistocene megafauna extinction event on extant mammal com communities. Professor Hadley founded the field of phylochronology by pioneering the study of genetic structure and diversity of populations through time, an approach that has yielded insights and predictions about ongoing and future responses of animals to global change. And today she will talk more about the mammalian response to climate change. Elizabeth. Well, thanks, Darcy, for that introduction, and thank you very much for having me here. It's um, amazing. I haven't been here before except for to go to the map sales room. Um, and I've been at uh, Stanford for about 15 years. So I'm delighted to come and talk to you about a little bit of biology. Uh, I know full well that there are people here that appreciate biology. And having a little bit of a background in geology myself, um, I really like the integration of both fields in thinking about how our climate is changing. So I start off with a picture of this polar bear, but it's not really a polar bear. It looks like it's kind of gotten a little dirty. And this polar bear is actually a hybrid, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about a little later on. But it's one of the unanticipated events that awaits us um, in the future, in the very near future. And so what I'd like to do is kind of give you a bit of a brief excursion into the kinds of ways that I think um, ecosystems and species will respond to climate change. And the reason I think this is because I've mined a little bit of the recent fossil history to understand how animals, and particularly mammals, have responded to climate change of the very recent past. So mammals diversified in light of climate changes. And, and uh, I'm on the x-axis here, you see time, so 70 million years ago to the present. And you see different colors. You don't need to worry about the names. I've got physical representations of them around this figure. This comes from John Alroy. And it basically just shows you the waxing and waning of different mammalian groups, mostly from North America, through the last 65, 70 million years. And the important point to note is that there are some animals, like the insectivores in yellow, that remain relatively constant in their uh, species richness. So this is the proportion of overall species here on the y-axis. And other species, like the kind of tax on wastebasket, tax on the condylorths, have kind of died out. The creodonts, shown in orange, the second to the last from at the bottom, they're completely gone now. And there are other species like rodents, shown in this blue, that have really expanded toward the modern. And during the last 65 million years, climates, of course, changed quite a lot. And this is a synopsis of how climate has changed. So what we see, again, time on the x-axis is kind of key events in the diversification and history of mammalian faunas, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, the time where the, the thermal gradient in the world, the latitudinal gradient, was the least profound as far as we know in the last 65 million years, and temperatures were the highest. The terminal Eocene event, a very abrupt cooling that remained, and the, the climates remained relatively cool for uh, about uh, 7 million years or so. 
Then the Middle Miocene, which remained relatively constant, but then began cooling into the Pliopleistocene until we get into Pliopleistocene glaciations. Climate today is warming. This is from a trip I took a couple of years ago to the top of Kilimanjaro. And you will all appreciate then these bands of lighter white ice and the bands of dark sandy deposits. Um, those come from previous periods in the history of Kilimanjaro over the last 10,000 years or so where climates were more xeric and warmer than they are today and they deposited these kind of soils, these, these uh, sediments on the ice. But the important thing is as you go up and you observe these sediments today, the ice itself is disappearing. So the records of these past climatic changes over the last 10,000 years are be becoming uh, lost. So this is happening around the world at glaciers elsewhere, and I just wanted to see this for myself. It's quite remarkable. There's hardly any water flowing from this ice. It's basically just sublimating, disappearing. Arctic sea ice is also uh, declining. The, the, the shaded area shows the average, the plus or minus two standard deviations from 1979 to the year 2000. And then what you see here, I think this is from the beginning of September, this actual plot from September 4th or something. Um, and what you see in the, the blue and the, and the uh, turquoise and purple are the years 2008, 2010, and 2011. And so even this year, which was arguably very wet and cool in much of North America, resulted in uh, a lower overall sea ice extent through the month of September than has been found there on average since 1979. And that's shown here also from this view of the North Pole and the, the average median, the median of ice from 1979 to 2000 shown in orange with present ice again, oh, this is from the 28th of August of this year. So this is so profound that you know, sea uh, shipping companies are talking about uh, moving ships in a large way across uh, the Arctic. So the world is rapidly warming. This is from the IPCC. We have different projections here. I've kind of plotted us on this projection. We're basically already past the yellow line of business as usual. We're already off the constant production curve. And there are different simulations showed on the, shown on the right side there with a best case scenario of something just on the order of one degree centigrade and the worst, the worst case on the order of something around uh, six degrees increase in temperature. We will be here. All uh, of our data show that we're basically plotting the, the red and the green line. We're following that line. So by the year 2050, temperatures on the planet, average global temperatures, are projected to be hotter than Homo sapiens has experienced in our time on the planet. So one of the values of using the fossil record is that we can give people the context of just kind of how much change we're likely to experience given the evolutionary history of species on Earth. So given our history, we're likely to experience global temperatures we have yet seen. And by the year 2100, global temperatures are likely to be warmer than most of the mammal species that comprise all of our global ecosystems have yet experienced in their time on Earth. So this is definitely uh, a change. And even in the best case, it means that the nature that we have grown accustomed to is in for some challenges. So one of the things we do in my lab is we look at how species have responded to changes. What do we expect animals to do? And there are some obvious things that are kind of probably coming to most of your minds. Species are expected to move around. They might track their environments, and so they'll go further north as climates change and get warmer where they are, or I should say poleward. But one of the ways of thinking about this using fossils is by looking at these past experiments of glacial, interglacial transitions and look to see how they respond. How do these mammals respond to different climatic events? 
So you all know Pleistocene glaciation around 18,000 years ago was pretty extensive. It covered about half of North America. And that meant that the animals that we have come accustomed to have had half the area to occupy. And as these glaciers, re glaciers receded, many mammals reorganized their distributions uh, considerably, while other animals went extinct. So the late Pleistocene-Holocene transition shown here from 21,000 years ago to the present, there was, it wasn't a single event. So the Boeing Alarod was a period of rapid warming followed dramatically by a period of rapid cooling known as the Younger Dryas event. And then that was succeeded by warming into the Holocene where the temperatures have remained relatively constant given this perspective of, of uh, temperature, given this perspective over the last 11,700 years or so. So at this transition event, both at the Bowling Alrod and at the Younger Dryas, there were extinctions. And there were dramatic reorganizations of species on the planet, including humans. A time transgressive event known as the, middle Pleist I mean, sorry, the late Pleistocene extinction occurred somewhere on the order of 50,000 50, years ago to 10,000 years ago, depending on where you are in the world. But it resulted in a global loss of something on the order of 194 uh, 95 species, almost all of which were larger than 44 kilograms or about 100 pounds, which is not coincidentally the average size of a human. So 90 genera went extinct globally and 34 extinct in North America. Most of these extinctions were mammals, although there are a few birds. And what you see here is a menagerie of North American animals that used to roam the Bay Area, for example all of which are gone now, or with the exception of the bison shown on the right, significantly dwarfed relative to their size in the Pleistocene. So one of the things we do is we go out and we excavate these fossil localities, and we look, most, most paleontologists are really interested in the extinct animals. In our lab, we focus really intensely on those animals that survived the extinction event in order to understand what they're expected to do with climatic change. So these, are, these purple dots show locations around the world where we've excavated Pleistocene and Holocene localities. We go out, it's relatively non-sophisticated work. Uh, a lot of this is work done in caves, although not all of it. And then we go out and we also trap small mammals in particular in the vicinity or amphibians, depending on what we're working on. And we can look then at kind of at the, at the moving picture of what a, an extant community is like and what it was like back through time. The information is extraordinarily high quality. They have the fossils. We have spend a lot of time basically assessing what the taphonomy or the, the, everything that happens from the death of the animal until we reveal it as a fossil is the field taphonomy. We spend a lot of time uh, trying to understand what those taphonomic biases are. And we do so using interesting uh, isotopes like strontium isotopes and trying to see, ascertain what the foraging radius of raptors or carnivores are, for example, or what the home ranges of the animals that are, end up in these cave deposits, what those individual home ranges are. So needless to say, in Yellowstone, we've documented that around 95% of all of the community ends up getting into these fossil localities, and almost all of it is basically collected very, very locally. So it's an extraordinarily powerful kind of subset of data to reconstruct the history of the local communities through time. This schematic shows how animals respond to climatic change. The very first thing that happens when the environments change is that population sizes are affected. So by this I'm not showing things like behavior, Animals, individuals and animals will move out of the sun if it's too hot into the shade, for example. But what I'm showing here are these are things we can detect in the fossil record. So at the population level, if the environment is something that these animals really prefer, they tend to stay there, they tend to reproduce there, and they can increase there. If the environment changes in such a way that they no longer like it, their populations will decline. Population size itself at one extreme 
of an, a massive increase will result in a range expansion. So those animals will then need to find new habitats for them to increase in abundance. And so they will expand. And on the other end of, on the, of the spectrum, population sizes that decline too much will decline to extinction. And so range adjustment and extinction are shown over on the right side. Population size itself also leads to genetic change and morphologic change as well. So those are both linked to changing populations. Over longer periods of time and uh, often larger spatial areas with some sort of barriers, those kinds of morphologic and genetic changes can accumulate to result in what we call speciation or the the splitting of lineages so that they have their own independent evolutionary trajectories and histories. And over lots of speciation events and lots of time and often between continents, you can end up with large differences in how communities and ecosystem function and often with things like the expansion of grasslands in the Miocene, you end up with something called biotic turnover where the way animals live off the land is very different. So in terms of these features that I just bring, bring to your example, I'm going to try and kind of summarize some of them to show what the, the evidence in the recent fossil history is for these events and what's happening today. In terms of morphology, I mentioned that the bison shrunk in size. So bison latifrons is known as the extinct bison. It actually is not extinct. It dwarfed, and you see in the center there a photo of an extinct bison with its horns and a, an extant bison in North America. So the North American bison is a descendant of this extinct, much larger form. And dwarfing is consistent with climatic warming. In mammals, and many animals actually, you find a decrease in body size with lower elevations and lower latitudes, and generally higher temperatures and you find an increase in size within species as you move up toward the poles and uh, up in elevation. Today, there's the same kinds of evidence, although this has been much less studied, but there's the same kinds of evidence in even small mammals in the desert southwest. This is a pack rat shown here on, uh, in, from the southwest, and this is just a documentation from a paper from 1989 to 1996 showing that body mass of this species, which is very tightly linked to temperature, shown up in the upper panel there, body mass in this species is decreasing through this time, which is consistent with warming through the same period. There are also changes in timing of reproductive events. This is a, uh, phenology is the, taming t the timing of events in species life. And this has cascading effects to things like body size and the number of litters per year. So this red squirrel is moving uh, further north. And partly what's happening is it's breeding earlier because its food, these dug fur, are becoming available earlier in the year. As it breeds earlier, earlier uh, litters have generally smaller uh, sized individual, uh, individuals in the litter, although they're, even though there are more frequent litters, sometimes they can add one or two litters per year, the individuals are smaller in each of those litters. Population size, as I mentioned, is a really profound one. And this is an example of what some people have called the poster child for global warming in the American West, the pika, the American pika. This is the only species in this family in uh, Western North America. And what you see here are different populations in the intermontane West. Those in black are prehistoric populations that are extinct now. They're no longer present, but we have been working on the fossils from these localities all through the intermontane West. And you can see this animal made it all the way down to the Colorado River um, in the Southwest. And, and then there are those populations shown in red. These are historic populations that are now extinct. So most of these populations have gone extinct in the last 50 years. And then the extant populations shown in purple. It turns out that the historic movement of this species is on the order in the last 50 years is up about 150 meters in some of these places. And there are some of these populations that are debatable about whether they're extinct or not. There are people that are out there trying to ascertain this. But we've already documented that there are genetic changes coincident with these population size 
uh, changes and the eradication of populations throughout the species range. Also at the community level, when you have a lot of populations change with, within species, between species and among a community, which is a, an assembly of species, you'll find corresponding changes at that scale too. And so our work in Northern California, we were looking at the last 20,000 years of history of the small mammal community outside of Mount Shasta. And here's the same kind of climatic event that I just showed you, the uh, climate proxy, temperature proxies from the Greenland ice core, the Younger Dryas and the Bowling Alarot are plotted on there. Human arrival to North America, probably sometime uh, uh, just after around 14,000 years ago. Right now, I put that up there with a question mark on there. The oldest human uh, site is thought to be Paisley Caves in uh, Oregon right now, and that's a, a date based on what is thought to be a human coprolite. And then megafaunal extinction follows the arrival of humans to North America. That's a debated thing about whether climate or humans uh, kind of caused, led to the demise of megafauna in North America, but most people think it was combined impact of both of them. So after the megafauna went extinct, one of the questions is, what did that change do to the small mammal communities? And it turns out that one of the measures that you can use to look at the effect of the community change is something called evenness. And evenness is just the relative proportion of the abundance of different animals in the community. So if everything it goes from zero to one, so if everything is perfectly even, everything is represented at exactly the same abundance, you'll find an evenness uh, very, uh, value of one. And if it's very extraordinarily uneven, it will glow, uh, deviate closer to zero. And what we found with just the small mammal community alone, so this is regardless of extinction of the megafauna, is that there is a dramatic drop in the evenness of the small mammal communities. So small mammal communities, if you looked at squirrels and deer mice and pack rats and uh, pocket gophers, they were pretty much evenly distributed in the landscape during the Pleistocene, but at this Pleistocene-Holocene transition, suddenly they became very uneven and they've remained that way through the last 10,000 years or so. So why is that? These animals did not experience an extinction. This is the same suite of animals, but they changed their relative proportions. The reason is because of the rise of these weedy species. This is the Paramiscus maniculatus. This is the most commonly trapped animal, mammal in North America. It is very widespread. It has a distribution almost all over the entire continent. It's got extraordinarily high intrinsic rates of growth. It doesn't care what the environment is like. You could go old growth forest, recently burned habitat, grassland, shrubland. It likes every environment. It's got very low habitat fidelity and it thrives in areas that are disturbed frequently. This animal then dominated has dominated the small mammal community in uh, California and probably around the country since the demise of the megafauna. It dominates the community at the expense of specialist species. Now, those of you with gardens might argue with me about this, although these guys are pretty good specialists on gardens. These are pocket gophers. They're uh, very interesting animals. They're mostly subterranean. They eat underground biomass. Uh, such as this lupin, which is very high in nitrogen. They uh, are extraordinarily specialized for digging through uh, dense soils. They dig these, uh, this is a, these are subnivian tunnels. They're very uh, active diggers. They spend a lot of energy. The energetic costs of burrowing are between 360 and 3,400 times higher than walking the same distance alone anyone would agree that this is a highly specialized way for a mammal to live. And it's like this in a relatively low oxygen environment. They rarely come above ground. They have very tiny eyes, tiny ears. They're highly adapted to moving around under soils. And importantly, they're highly adapted to moving soils themselves. They have profound effects on 
ecosystems. Within a week, they changed the plant biomass in the area. They changed the water depth, how deep water can penetrate in soils. Over years, they, uh, they contribute dramatically to changes in plant heterogeneity, which you can just see from these mima mounds. Um, you can see the purple flowers are basically dominating the areas where the pocket gopher mounds are not. These have lasted for probably thousands of years. They have altered succession rate. And what ends up happening is you have much more heterogeneity in the plant biomass when you have gophers present than without them. They change succession rate and the succession path. And if you look at minor mounds, for example, they're arguably really important in, in the, just the topography itself. So they're really important ecosystem engineers. These animals actually took a hit from the Pleistocene-Holocene uh, transition. And so one of the things, this is an example, and I won't go into detail, but I just want to give you an example about how we can use genetics to address some of these questions within species. So we're in the process of doing this for multiple species, but gophers are one of our first choice because we can ask, has the population size changed through this time? We have both the fossils and we have the DNA from the fossils, which are two independent ways of reconstructing uh, population size. And, and combined, they can help us understand how the structure of populations, what that means is how individuals are exchanged between isolated areas and whether or not their history of change relates to something we know about in the environment. For an example, this is a, a phylogenetic tree. So this tree just shows you, you don't need to worry about the numbers, but you can just see that there are clades of, of groups. This is a, in, on the right side is the geographic range of this particular gopher, the California uh, pocket gopher, the mommy's body. And the, red, the pink shows you its geographic range. It's got a very large geographic range. And you can see in the northern part of California, it's basically at the edge of its range. So right there is where we have this Pleistocene locality. And there are different clades or lineages of these, of these gophers that are found in different parts of their, of their distribution. Northern California has a group of individuals just unique to Northern California. And so by using the ancient DNA of fossils, we can actually ask whether or not that's something that is consistent through time or whether or not we had, say, some pre-adapted forms come from a southern locale, locale or a, a, a eastern or western locale come in to replace the local uh, subspecies. And the color doesn't show up very well here, but you have exactly the same clade here. So you see modern in orange, the top big, all of those colors, all of those lines are different ancient samples that we've looked at. So in the modern and in the Holocene and in the Pleistocene, they're all from the same clade. So what that means is that the, ex the expansion or contraction of what's been going on in Northern California is all a local phenomenon. There's no gene flow from somewhere else in California or somewhere else in the Great Basin that's basically accounting for those changes. It's all happening locally. That's really consistent with what we know about gophers in general. In spite of their ability to colonize your garden really rapidly, they actually do not move into other territories of other gophers. Very rarely do they move around. Another example of kind of the cascading effects of popula population size change with warming is an example of this bilberry, which is shown to just this year, there was a study that came out in Scandinavia, I think in northern Norway, that shows, uh, and I did misspell Scandinavia, that shows a decline in the bilberry. And that's led to a decline in the bilberry moth, which has led to a decline in all three of these species, which eat the larvae of the bilberry moth, as well as the bilberry itself, which has also led to a decline in these voles, which depend upon the bilberry. And so the decline of one plant species has led to these cascading effects of, of these, these other species. By the way, none of these other species are directly influenced by temperature themselves. They're all influenced by temperature acting through the bilberry and its distribution. So I mentioned geographic range as one way that animals respond. And in fact, that's one of the most abundant 
kinds of information we have from the fossil record, and especially the Pleistocene-Holocene transition, is we have data that show that ranges of even the small animals that did not go extinct changed dramatically with the Pleistocene-Holocene transition. There aren't any, so far as I know, explanations that humans are implicated in this. This is clearly consistent with the ecological niches of these animals responding to temperature. So in black, we see in North America, Pleistocene localities for this uh, bog lemming, and except one locality, the species distribution today does not overlap the Pleistocene distribution at all. This animal moved north, which is consistent with climate. However, not, animal, not all species move north. Some of them move west because they're more sensitive to uh, moisture than they are to temperature, for example. So geographic range changes affected some animals in California from our excavations in Samwell Cave. These are the mountain beaver and the white-footed vole, both of which depend on wet, old-growth dug fir forest. They're both now much restricted. The mountain beaver is not a, really confined to mountains, nor is it a beaver, but it is a very old lineage of rodents in its own family that used to be diverse in the Miocene. There were many species across the American West. It's now the only species left in the entire world. And this animal is restricted to these very unusual Pacific Northwest coastal forests and as is the white-fitted vole, of which there are a handful of specimens known. So these two animals were present in Samuel Cave in the Pleistocene, and they've contracted their ranges dramatically. So here's one of the big events that happened at the Pleistocene-Holocene transition, and that's the colonization of the Americas by humans. There's a lot of debate about how humans actually got here, although most people now would say that it was either the coastal route through some, you know, basically the Channel Islands and many of these sites being underwater perhaps, or the, just to the, um, through the uh, ice-free corridor to the east of the Rocky Mountains coming down and through the Great Basin and the east side of the coast range. Until the uh, coprolite was dated at Paisley Caves in Oregon, the oldest well-documented site in North America was in Monte Verde, Chile, all the way at the very south in Patagonia. That was the oldest site of human colonization of the Americas, which is why some people propose that maybe they came across the ocean, but there's no evidence for that. So geographic range change is also happening today with animals. This is one example of the nine-banded armadillo. This is an animal that's actually related. Most of its uh, relatives are from South and Central America. In 1850, its northern limit was the Rio Grande. It somehow made it across the Rio Grande during that time, and it's been basically marching ever north since then. It's limited by, ha by uh, freeze days. So if there are fewer than 24 freeze days, this is very similar to what limits the mountain uh, pine beetle, by the way, the bark pine beetle. If there are fewer than 24 freeze days, it can expand and reproduce. Otherwise, it freezes and, and doesn't move. And what's happening is as we decrease the number of consistent free day freeze days, this armadillo is moving north, and this is its projection shown in the light, in the light pink. Geographic ranges have been modeled into the future. This is an example of the grizzly bear. This is also an example that relies on its food source. The grizzly bear turns out that white bark pine cones and the nuts in the white bark pine are extraordinarily important for grizzly bear overwinter cub survival. You can actually plot the number of white bark pine seed sets and overwinter survival of cubs. It's a very important carbohydrate source for uh, grizzly bears. And as the white bark pine is reducing from climate, this is completely regardless of what's happening with the beetle. These, these models were done before the beetle really took hold. The grizzly bears are likely to decline. In this part of the range, grizzly bears, bears are declining, but they are moving for farther north. And that's bringing them in contact with another Native American bear, the polar bear. So this is a slide taken from uh, National Wildlife Magazine, but this is from an island in the uh, Beaufort Sea. This island, um, the Native people there still hunt uh, bowhead whales, and when they bring the carcasses on land, the polar bears, basically this is what they do, they kind of pile them on the, the, the uh, coast so that the polar bears will go after the bowhead whales and not after the Native American village. 
And what's been happening more and more is that grizzly bears are swimming the small channel from the mainland, from the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and feeding on the bowhead carcasses that the polar bears are feeding on. Now, not only did grizzly bears and polar bears not used to overlap their geographic ranges, they didn't overlap their temporal patterns, but because there's less sea ice, the polar bears are spending more time on land, and they're running into grizzly bears. And as they run into grizzly bears, they breed with them. So there are increasing examples of hybrid events between grizzly bears and polar bears, and that's causing these surprise uh, novel bears. They're called pizzly bears. And <laughs> The hybrids, you can see, have dark marks. They have very typical morphologies through each of these hybrid events. There was one shot by a hunter. I don't have that image here, but they have these kind of dark eyes that look a bit like a grizzly bear, and you can see that in both the hybrids at the top there, whereas there's a polar bear for comparison and a grizzly bear for comparison on the right side. But interestingly, this kind of external morphology, they also have very different... Uh, coverings of hair on their, the pads of their feet. Polar bears, shown in the, the second to the last, they have completely covered pads on their feet. Grizzly bears have no hair on the pads of their feet, and the hybrids are kind of half and half. In addition, their behaviors are a hybrid. These pizzly bears have a behavior that's very much like a polar bear hunting a seal. They pounce with two front legs on top of what they're going after. It's not necessarily well adapted for a lot of hunting of larger mammals or um, like caribou, for example, which is what grizzly bear might be more likely to encounter, or carrion. They also have very different, this is a, the center panel is a cross-section of their hairs. Polar bear hair cross-section is much, pretty much hollow, which is what keeps them insulated, and the grizzly bears are not at all and the hybrids are combination. And all, not only that, but there are different hairs in different parts of their body that have these different adaptations. So my point here is to ask the question, you know, what is the hybrid in a sense adapted for? The grizzly bear and the polar bear are probably relatively young species. They probably separated just as recently as maybe 200,000 years ago. And clearly, this hybrid event is bringing, they're still able to reproduce in part because they're such young species. So it's bringing up some surprises. So species replacements, the other thing that's happening in this part of Alaska and Canada is that the northerly species like the caribou that specialize in the tundra, the very open uh, environment, are being replaced by animals such as the moose as the moose's preferred habitat expand as well. The tundra, is, the permafrost is melting in many places in this village that I spent time in in the Beaufort Sea. They had, for the first time, just a few weeks before I had visited there, for the first time, they had a moose in their village. This is in the middle of the ocean. They had a moose that kids had never seen, a moose in their village. The moose just, just swam the channel, and they shot it and killed it, but they had a moose in, in their environment. The bowhead whale that they had captured that year, that fall, which was last year, was pregnant. This is also something they had never seen before because it appears that reproduction in these whales is a little bit off. And I don't know if you guys have been following the news, but some of these whales have made it through the Arctic Sea and have been found as far south in the Atlantic as the Mediterranean. So species replacements are starting to occur, and that comes also with species conflicts. So you can have happy kind of meetings like you do with the, pipe, the polar bear and the grizzly bear. But with these two foxes, the Arctic fox and the red fox, increasingly people on the pipeline are seeing these aggressive encounters. And it turns out the red fox, which is much more aggressive, is in often hunting and killing these Arctic foxes to expand its territory. So these conflicts will become uh, more prevalent in the future. Humans have also increased our conflicts with wildlife. There are many, many examples, but this is, uh, I'm just st now starting to work on the genetic diversity of tigers in India. This is Bangladesh. So you can see this enormous uh, delta, and these are mangrove forests. The dark areas are mangrove forests. This particular tiger specializes in swimming in these mangroves. It's the big dominant carnivore in this area. As sea level rises just a few inches 
it can no longer live in these mangrove forests. And where does it go? Right into one of the most densely populated areas on Earth in Bangladesh. And so increasingly tigers are coming into conflict with humans. They're killing humans and humans are killing the tigers. The other thing that happens is something that's facilitated by animals like these habitat generalists that are really kind of happy in disturbed environments. And deer mice, for those of you who don't know, are big carriers of disease like hantavirus. Hantavirus is now, it's been endemic, but it's been kind of lurking in the background. And so there are hot spots of hantavirus outbreak now all over the American West and in uh, Canada and in, even in South America. So there are, there are rodent uh, uh, population increases that are associated with the spread of hantavirus there too. And in general, the rise of these generalist species that live in very dense colonies or concentrations mean there is a lot more probability of spread of disease. And so one of the things in our future is a lot more with human wildlife interactions and with the increase of these generalist species is a lot more animal caused diseases. So there's definitely this megafaunal extinction. This caused a pretty large change in the large animals. This kind of extinction coincident with human expansion around the globe and also um, the extinction of these mega herbivores is exactly what's happening today. Megafauna are the species that generally have fewer, popul- fewer numbers of individuals with the exception of humus, humans and uh, there's a role for both this increased warming and human expansion at the same time. There's also historic extinction. Most of these extinctions, climate has not been implicated in most of these extinctions, but humans and their spread of things like cats um, or the introduction of non-native species has led to the demise of species. This is an example of a bat, of a carnivore, of small mammals, and of a marsupial in Australia. These kinds of extinctions have been increasing since the middle 1800s and they're increasing rapidly even in areas that are not presently dominated by human populations, but they're starting to experience, these populations are starting to experience the role of humans elsewhere on the planet. About a quarter of all mammal species are known uh, as threatened right now. And And one of the questions I get asked is whether or not speciation can rescue diversity. Speciation is certainly something that's influenced diversity through the last 65 million years for mammals. Why not have speciation rescue mammalian diversity now? And the reason is because in spite of this extraordinarily wonderful book by a Danish soldier called The Snouters, where he kind of came fancifully came up with all sorts of hypothetical creatures, Hypothetical creatures, the species of the future, are going to take many millions of years to evolve. The average mammal species takes about two to five million years to turn over. We would need about a million years to recover the diversity that we're losing in the next century or so. So how do animals respond to climate events? I've showed you kind of examples of all of these. Um, immigration, including humans, range adjustments, genetic change, morphologic change, extinction, and population size change. Speciation is not going to rescue diversity, and that leaves the question about whether or not functional turnover and biotic turnover are likely to be fueled by something that we don't understand, or in fact, just the loss of what we have on the planet today. So can mammals keep up when climate warms? The answer is that in the near term, mammals will certainly be moving around. They'll be assembling novel communities. They'll be less speciose. There'll be fewer numbers of species of different kinds. Overall, the mammals that we have left will be smaller than the ones we even see now. They'll be less genetically diverse. They'll be less migratory. They won't need to move around as much because their environments will be much more uh, complacent year-round. They'll be less likely to hibernate. They will be generalists. They will be more concentrated locally because their habitats between each each population, there'll be fewer uh, habitats um, distributed there. And those species that are uh, present will be more disease-laden. 
So, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry about that. So I guess the question is, um, and this is something we have to choose, the fossil record can tell us a lot about what kinds of events will happen. But our question is, do we go from these diverse landscapes that used to characterize, for example, the Great Plains, to monocultures or intensely urban environments? And really, it's, it's our future and it's our choice. These are the questions that scientists can only give you information about, but not necessarily provide um, the decisions for. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Are there any questions? Yes. Oh, well, thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, uh, this last year has been pretty cool. Uh, and <laughs> I was wondering if you can put that in perspective in terms of average global temperature. Uh, has it remained uh, stable since uh, the previous year or two? Or has it actually uh, uh, increased in spite of what we're feeling here on the West Coast? So it's, you know, global temperature is obviously an average, right? And so even though it's remain, it was relatively cool, there are parts of the globe that weren't relatively cool. And as you can see, the kind of the sum total of the lag of global climates when I showed the Arctic ice cover. The Arctic ice cover is still, even this year, in spite of what was thought to be more snowfall and cooler temperatures in a lot of North America, was still much less than even the last, the, the last 30 years average. So I don't exactly know what global temperature was this year. Um, I, don't, I don't know that number, but does somebody else know? We don't have it yet. Yeah, it's not even the end of the year, but, but I don't, so I don't know how it compares, except I know that the emergent effects of global temperature in terms of Arctic sea, sea ice, for example, which is the most recent stuff I have, is still low, lower than the long-term average. Anybody else want to add to that? Uh, yeah, that's right. The Southwest had epic fires in, in Arizona and New Mexico. So that's an important thing to remember is that it's really uh, different depending on where you are. Could you say something about the rate of extinction of these mammals? And I'm particularly interested if, if we were to actually do something about climate change. People talk of a time like, I don't know, 50, 100 years. Uh, so that the rate of change would be important in that context. What would happen while, if we made the decision today to actually uh, address uh, the uh, climate change? So there, this is a, a long, as you can imagine, there can be many ways to answer this question, and it can take quite a while. So long live species, like I'm working right now on tigers and trying to project future genetic diversity of tigers. They have a generation time maybe of 20 to 25 years. So they actually harbor a lot of genetic diversity, for example, even though they occupy 5% of their geographic range from the 1800s. They're almost completely gone. They still harbor a lot of genetic diversity. But because they have a long generation time, this is true for whales as well, and it's true for northern fur seals, which we've studied, because they have a long generation time, it's taken a while for those individuals that have a lot of genetic diversity to, to die out. So even though their populations are not replacing them, it's taking a while for that to happen. The condor is probably another example of a long, slow burn. Other animals, like these small mammals, have a generation time of a year or less, and their response is very, very rapid. The megafaunal extinction at the Pleistocene-Holocene transition has been really well dated by a guy named Tom Stafford and colleagues like Russ Graham. And they've been able to look to see how frequently do you find, you know, what's the, what's the longest lived of, the, of the, the large mammals. Different animals go extinct at different times. I said it's time transgressive, but in North America, they're virtually all gone by about 10,800 years. So it happened relatively quickly and both the climate, as I showed you, and human arrival to the continent maybe took place, you know, the climate started to change maybe 2,000 years before that. So in terms of exactly what climate change caused the demise of these guys, it's tough to figure out. 
There's an example of an extinction on an island that doesn't include humans, and that's the Irish elk in Ireland, and that is coincident with the bowling owl rod event. So that happens, sorry, the Younger Dryas event. That happens at that dramatic cooling, and it can be dated almost abruptly. It probably happened on the order of a few decades. So I think it depends on the animal you're looking at. Some of these animals will never recover, and some of them can. I was wondering if you could give us any examples of um, the effects on mammals or other uh, larger fauna that may have been affected already in the Bay Area, whether they are year-round here or migrating here for the winter or migrating here for the summer. Hmm. Um, let's see. I'm sure there are some. Hmm. So one of the things that we've recently looked at, I mean, I work a lot with these small mammals, but there are examples like uh, the California tiger salamander, for example, that's native to the peninsula, and that's showing a big decline, although no one's really done the prehistoric work on that species to understand how much of that is related to climate and how much of that is related to human uh, expansion. Other species like the vole, there's the California vole, Microtus californicus, and we've done some studies, some work on the California vole to look at the genetic diversity of that species and try to compare California diversity with diversity, say, at Jasper Ridge um, in the coast range here. And the diversity of that species shows that it's a little depauperate in the peninsula relative to the rest of California. But again, we don't have the prehistoric data for the Bay Area to show whether or not that's something that's declined or if it's just an effect of being on the peninsula here. So in terms of what I know about the Bay Area, most of the data I have don't, for the small mammals don't relate to climate. It's mostly anecdotal. The large mammals certainly, I mean, there, there are mammoths in San Jose, um, and they're still being excavated and exhumed and, and uh, whales in deposits, you know, pretty elevated. Mostly that's tectonics and sea level change. But I'm not answering your question perfectly because nothing is coming to mind except for the Pleistocene. So, sure. Thank you for such a clear presentation. I wondered that the problem is so pervasive and so large. Um, it was interesting the examples that you mentioned where um, the problem was regional or you could look at it regionally and I wondered um, what initiatives are going on because it would seem to me that that would be the most effective way to start if you could get local regions protecting local species. So I've recently spent some time um, traveling to Washington because I feel like I have information that might be valuable for thinking about how to anticipate change. And I've actually thought a lot about what would, what would I do? I mean, short of kind of stopping global warming and stopping habitat fragmentation, what's really important? And um, I and colleagues have come up with ways to kind of decide what we value. And I don't mean we myself, I mean we as people. We value wilderness, we value species, Everybody resonates, something resonates with you when you talk about the condor or the tiger or the Joshua tree. We value kind of ecosystems. So the Yellowstone ecosystem is one that people know. There are all sorts of animals they can imagine it, and they value that place for that ecosystem. And, of course, we value ecosystem services. We value clean water and wood and products that we use. And there are ways to manage lands for each of those objectives. And in some ways, I think one of the best ways of thinking about that is making sure that we keep a little bit of all of those things. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say I'm willing to sacrifice uh, a polar bear or a grizzly bear, but I would go so far as to say you should anticipate that this will happen. What are you going to do, if anything? This is the natural migration of a grizzly bear trying to handle a changing environment. This is a natural contraction of a polar bear with no ice to be on you can anticipate that they will interbreed. What is the likely response? So I think those are, ch those are challenging questions that I think we need to grapple with as a society and decide what we really do value. So yes, I, would, I mean, I've talked with Claire about what are the native plant species for Palo Alto, 
And that's a different question than what are the species that are likely to persist for the next 100 years here with climate change. The trees are going to be here a lot longer than we will. What are the right species to anticipate as climates change? So I think those are the important questions that urban areas, Chicago is doing this, that urban areas should be grappling with. And I, I think we could do a better job of it ourselves. This is a very general question, but I'd still like to ask it. Uh, how are we as humans impacted by increase in temperature alone? I know we're subjected to all sorts of things. Um, are we totally generalist? We can go anywhere? Or is there some temperature increase that will start impacting us? You mean in an intrinsic way? In you mean directly? Yeah. So that's also a good question. I've actually, so I'm not going to answer it in terms of indirect things like our crops and our disease and things like that. But directly, there's been, there was a study that I was aware of where um, people try, they looked at uh, graveyard samples of humans and body size to look to see. So there are two kind of major events in the last couple thousand years. The medieval warm period, which is about a thousand years ago, that's when Europeans colonized Greenland and the Vikings basically wreaked havoc in Europe and the Little Ice Age, and that's when the Greenland populations contracted. And so I know that this, this, uh, this study was aimed at trying to see if human body size changed in response to those environmental events. They found anecdotal that, data that it did, but they couldn't ascertain whether or not that had to do with famine or feast during those same time intervals. So there's probably a relationship there indirectly, and they weren't able to separate those things out from temperature. I think that's a really interesting question. I don't think it's been really addressed. Uh, I have a question. Uh, as humans become increasingly the dominant uh, animal in the landscape, isn't it an important factor in other animal survival, their ability to coexist with humans? Obviously, tigers and Bangladeshis don't coexist very well. Right. But in my backyard, I get right. the raccoons and opossums. That's that right. They even coexist with our cats. Um, is there any <coughs> attempt to look at yes. changes in animals to make them more, either by artificial selection because we shoot the aggressive ones, <laughs> or or by adaptation? to get along better with humans so, and be able so to... So yeah, work. a really good example is the house mice. Those species that you're talking about are called commensals. So we have our domesticated animals, and actually they do a good job of replacing the mega herbivores too. right? Our ca so with the Industrial Revolution, with our human increase in population size, our domesticated animals did the same thing. But commensal species do in fact show really different adaptations. So house mice are very different from their field mice relative, close relative. They show different kinds of predator avoidance. They show different kinds of activity. They specialize in human diet. So what humans eat, the grains that humans eat, instead of going out, so instead of showing the booms and busts that they would normally show in the field, they have very, so those are thought to be underlain by genetic changes and that study is underway with some colleagues right now in India. It's a really interesting question and I think everything so far as we, they show difference in pelage color, difference in, you know, predator avoid, all sorts of stuff. It's a really interesting question. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, is it too early to f figure out where the current wave of extinction sits relative to the mass extinctions of the geologic record? So there's some recent work on that. So are we in the midst of the sixth mass extinction? And if so, how do we, and how do we know? Um, and my colleague, Tony Barnowski at Berkeley works on that exact question. And as you can imagine, by using fossils, it's pretty tough to kind of correlate the record we have for the last um, 500 million years with what we have today. We can't even count all the species we have now, let alone all the species that used to be on the planet. But he has some very convincing data that he published in a nature paper last year that I would point you to that suggests that we're right on the brink for some groups and we have a lot, not a long ways, but a, we have enough time ahead of us that we could change the trajectory if we wanted to for other groups. It's a great question. Okay, I think we'll thank our speaker.
Thank you.